days, you've been hearing about different things, and I think this is very appropriate because you've heard about the 2030 initiative to try to get to net zero. You've heard about different delivery methods. In fact, uh, the gentleman from NIBS yesterday spoke about uh, the P3 process, public-private partnership. We happen to have commissioned uh, a project last year. It's a school building. It's the first in North Carolina that was delivered under a P3 public-private partnership uh, method of delivery. It's also the first net positive school in the state of North Carolina. And to our knowledge, it's the first net positive P3 school in the United States. Uh, it was delivered last year, came online in August. It's been up and operating now uh, for about nine to ten months. Uh, Hansen was the commissioning authority on the project. Uh, because of our commitments and where we were at the time, we engaged Gretchen Coleman, who's with us today. She's going to help me with the presentation. She helped in the commissioning of the school. We're going to go through today, talk a little bit about that delivery method. We're going to talk a little bit about the systems, the fact that it's net positive, go through them, some of the challenges that we encountered during the commissioning, some of the lessons learned, and at the very end, we're actually going to jump out on the dashboard uh, that's out there. It's web interfaced, and we're going to go out and take a look at how it's operating today. We're going to take a look at a little bit of the historic data. It's used not only to monitor the school and its utilities, it's also used as a teaching aid because this is, particular school is a STEM-focused uh, science, technology, engineering, and math type of school. So with that, start out talking a little bit about the public-private partnerships, this P3 arrangement. And most of you probably know that in the United States, you see most of this P3 work being done in the infrastructure markets. You see it more for tollways, roads, bridges, et cetera. You don't see as many buildings delivered this way. There are a few. In fact, one of them, in one of the presentations yesterday that talked about a courthouse in California that was delivered that way. But uh, it's very common in the UK, it's very common in Canada uh, for hospitals and other public buildings. So, you know, what is it really? Well, the government as an entity provides some sort of incentives. It may be the transfer of an asset. In this case, it happened to be a land, a piece of land. There could be grants, there could be tax breaks, some sort of incentive that gets de delivered over to the developer. The developer then takes that incentive. He's required to turnkey the project. He obtains the financing. He designs it. He builds it, constructs it. And then he may, depending upon the lease agreement, be required to maintain it. Now, in this particular case, we'll talk about it. That maintenance is kind of split between the users and the uh, developer. And then the users, the leasee, which in this case is a school district, they basically use the facility, they operate the facility, and they would be responsible for utility costs, except there really aren't utility costs. It's a net positive, and we'll talk about that in a second. And then they do do some maintenance. Now, on this particular school, that break is done. The uh, developer or the owner of the facility does all the maintenance related to the systems, HVAC systems, photovoltaic systems, et cetera, what I call the housekeeping part of it with respect to the school, and I'm talking about janitorial services, cleaning services, waste, you know, de, you know de, uh, getting rid of the waste on a daily basis, all of that is handled by the school district. So that's kind of the split that, that uh, occurs. So what are the advantages of a P3 delivery? Okay, well in one case, you're harnessing the expertise and the efficiency of the private sector. I think everybody would agree that the private sector in a capitalistic society where you're looking to maintain a profit is going to be a little bit more efficient than some of the burden that would be put on you with the government doing that development on that particular facility. It's there, in terms of the government, it's an off-balance sheet method for financing. What I mean by that is instead of that entity, in this case the school district, incurring the debt and having it on their balance sheet, either through selling bonds or whatever, it's off their sheet. It's a lease arrangement. They're leasing the school, and that leasing is more of an operating cost. Okay, Speed of delivery. This school was delivered in 12 months, construction. 
from the, when they broke ground, cleared the site, to when the kids came in was literally 12 months. Possible tax credits, tax credits and breaks. I told you that it had to be incentivized, and that's how it was in this case. And there were two types. There was the energy tax credits for the photovoltaic system, and it just so happens that North Carolina has a very advantageous for renewable energy at tax credits. I mean, they're, they're comparable to what the federal government will give you. In addition, they had these new market tax credits. Now, those of you that aren't familiar with those, back in the year 2000, there was a tax relief program that came out. And the idea was to incentivize investment in what was low-income, really disadvantaged areas of the country. And this is a very rural area. It is a very poor area. The school system doesn't really have a lot of access to capital. It doesn't have a very big tax base. So those new market tax credits also came into play. What else does it do? It eliminates bid day risk. It eliminates construction risk. So, so basically, you've told the developer, we want you to turnkey and deliver this school. So we're not worried about whether it hits budget when it comes in. You've got to build it. We're not worried about any change orders from the contractor. You've got to build it. We want the school when you get done. So in the end, it integrates the design, build, finance, and operating together in one entity, and that's what we've done here. So for Sandy Grove Middle School, the county owned the land, and they leased it to the entity, the developer. In this case, the developer was first floor K-12 Solutions. It's an LLC. It was set up specifically to do P3 projects, and specifically for schools. Again, that legislation in North Carolina came into play about two years ago that allowed these P3 development for schools. They, in turn, build it, own it, and then lease it to the school system. Okay? So the team that created and developed the project, I'm listing the major players here, first floor K-12 through Solutions is the owner and developer of the school. Okay? And the architect, design architect, is SFL plus A. They're based out of Raleigh. And it so happens that the, the, several of the principles of these two are the same. In other words, these are sister companies. The, the president and CEO of SFLA also, because he's so, somewhat of an entrepreneur, saw this as a real opportunity. He still sees it as such that P3 is going to be the wave of the future for a lot of school development. So those two are pretty much married together. The MEP engineers are out of Charlotte. It's Optima Engineering. We were the commissioning authority on the project, and Metcon was a general co contractor slash CM. So as far as the school itself, here's really a floor plan of the school. It's got three wings, as you can see here, for classrooms. It's also got the common area. It's all been identified there. As I mentioned earlier, it's a STEM school, science, technology, engineering, and math. It was about 74,000 square feet, designed for 624 students, and it's got several high-performance systems. Again, it's a ground source geothermal heat pump system. You've got water source heat pumps that serve the bulk of the school. As far as the ventilation goes, you've got DOAS units, water source DOAS units. It's got high output LED lighting. At least 80% of all the lighting inside and outside of the school is LED. Load bearing masonry, enhanced building automation system. We'll talk about that later. The resource monitoring systems are really the systems that are picking up the metering, picking up the energy and utilities and rolling it back in through the BAS and pushing it out to the dashboard. And the solar photovoltaic system. Other sustainability features of this particular school include the fact that it's got an enhanced envelope with, as it says there, six inches of rigid insulation in the roof and three inches of sprayed foam insulation in the walls. You've got high efficiency plumbing fixtures that are basically re reducing the water uh, usage consumption by about 40 percent. They installed three electric vehicle charging stations, and you can kind of see them here lined up. 
These are free charging stations to anybody who wants to use them. If there's somebody at the school that has an electric vehicle, they can park it next to one of these and charge it. There's no, no charge. These are fed through the solar PV system. 75% of the construction waste was diverted from landfills. 20% of all the construction materials included recycled content. And as it says here, 30% was produced within the region. It's that local uh, materials issue. It's part of LEED so that, you know, you don't have that transportation issue. So it's all relatively local. And then the furniture is certified green. And what that means is it's got several aspects how you can get green certified. But if it's wood furniture taken from a sustainable forest, uh, if it's uh, got recycled content as they made it, or to ensure that any kind of finish on the furniture, any kind of upholstery, has very low emitting VOCs, really none at all. So the benefits of leasing the school, the project was delivered uh, in 12 months. We talked about that. Energy positive, it actually generates between 30 and 40 percent more electricity than it consumes. We estimated that it's going to save the county about $35 million over the next 40 years. $16 million of that is on the energy side. It was designed to lead platinum standards. I don't believe they've got their plaque yet. I know we've got all our information in. I just don't think that it's, it's, it's come back yet. It's got the, the tax credits I spoke about, so it reduces the total cost of ownership by about 70%. Okay. Uh, what you see here on the left-hand side, up above is a rendering of the school before it was built. But down below is an aerial view, and you can see that all of the roofs are covered with PV panels. Uh, there's over 2,000 PV panels on this project. So very briefly, from a life cycle sense, talking about that 70%, if you did this in a traditional delivery way, the construction would be about $21.5 million. Your utilities would be, this is life cycle over 40 years, it would be 16, about $16 million. And that was projected with an escalation rate over the time for the uh, utilities. And you'd be paying about $16 million in interest, okay? Instead, the tax credits, eliminating the interest, the utilities are gone, it's net positive. Really, the delivery with the least to the uh, school district is about $16.3 million. Okay, so this is another slide that shows you the difference over 40 years with having a net positive school. The fact that uh, this one is, and this is aggressive, and I'll be the first to admit it, to say that there's 5% escalation a year on utilities, but we really don't know what they are. You know, I mean, it could be 5%, it could be a lot less, it could be more. We don't know 40 years out what, what it's going to be. But here it shows you about an extra $20 million in operating that, a school over that period of time. So talking a little bit about the solar photovoltaic system for a second, the local utility in this rural area is really a cooperative, the Lumbee River Electrical uh, Cooperative. So we've got a 589 kW photovoltaic system, and it's split between two meters, okay? So 504 of it is grid connected. It feeds directly into the grid. And anybody that knows about solar full, um, photovoltaic, you, if you've ever heard the term buy all, or sell all, buy all, which means basically you sell everything you generate to the utility company and then you buy back what you need. This is a little bit like that, but it's a hybrid. Because the 504 is grid connected, it's sold to the utility company, they get a check every month. The other 85 kW of PV ties in on the building side of the uh, second meter, and it helps to offset what needs to be purchased. So the first 85 K kW is really feeding the school. If they need any more than that, they have to buy it back from the utility company. The reason the system was oversized, I'm talking about that 30 to 40 percent, and that's against peak. Normally, it's even more oversized than that because you're normally not at peak, was that we wanted to eliminate any power bill. The negotiated rates are uh, 12.8 cents, okay, and the payment is 5.1 cents. So if you had to buy it, you're buying it at 12.8. If you're selling it, you're selling it at 5.1. 
The solar panels are by REC. They're a recognized leader in solar. They're 250 watt panels. That's kind of an outline of one of them there, a picture. There's 2,310 panels that are mounted on the roof, generating 751 megawatt hours annually. That's again, it's about 40% more than the, the school will need. The design and installation was done by a company, Power Secure, and they specialize in PV systems. They've done very, very large ground mounted systems that are in the megawatt range. The modules are connected in strings up on the roof, typically eight modules per string. They come and are combined in combiner boxes. There's a picture of one there. And then they go into subarrays, which are then collected into big arrays, which then feed down into the inverters. And in fact, if I went back a slide, there's your inverters, ground mounted. There's several of them. Those are the, basically take the DC power, convert it to AC. There's also a weather station. You can kind of see it on the upper right there that's on the roof. That's not only tied into the data acquisition system for the PV, it also feeds into the BAS system as well. So some of the measurements and checks we did, you can see them here on the left-hand side. We went through all the combiner boxes to check out the DC voltage, the amperage. We actually checked the irradiance. It happened to be a very bright, sunny day. We were very close to uh, design conditions that day. Checking the temperature, ground uh, impedance, the inverter, we actually did measurements on the inverters to compare them against what we were getting out of the, the panels that were on there. And then taking a look at the summary operation. So if you did the math on the 2310 panels and you took it times 250, you're going to come out and you're going to tell me, Bob, that's only 577 kW. Where's the other 12 kW? Well, it's in these solar trees. There's four trees that are about 20 foot in height. They each have 12 panels on them, and they contribute 12 kW of power into the system. Um, they're a very expensive way to get 12 kW. But again, uh, it's one of those features where you're trying to demonstrate to the community that this is a sustainable building, sustainable school. You're trying to show that energy efficiency. Uh, so these four trees were located there. And as you see there, it's basically combining clean energy with art, solar art, so to speak. So beyond this, you've got a standby generator. There's a standby generator that is capable of carrying the, the entire capacity of the school when it needs to, uh, 600 K, uh, kW. Now currently, there's one arrangement, as they say there, for demand response. The utility has control of it. The utility doesn't, does not have a lot of generating capability and does have to buy power from other utilities when it needs it. So there's an arrangement right now that it will pay the owner slash developer and has control to start that generator and run it anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours when they have a demand response. They will pay for that. There's a separate one that they're working out it sounds like the same thing, but there's a subtle difference between demand response and peak demand, so that during the summer, which is when that utility company sees its peak demand, they have a right to start that generator and run it at, uh, during the summer, which just so happens this school is not used during the summer, so it doesn't have a big demand, so that's another revenue stream that the owner is going to enjoy when that deal gets worked out. And then talk a little bit of LED lighting. I spent... I said earlier that about 80% of the lighting for this school is LED, inside and outside. Uh, they use 60% less energy than standard fluorescence. The standard fluorescent that was modeled was, as you can see here, a three lamp 32 watt T8, which was about 90 watts. We upgraded, you can see it's Cree lighting, to really a 40 watt LED troffer. Immediate reduction of about 50% or 56% in energy use. On top of that, we've got various controls within the school, occupancy sensors. There's a, a scheduling that actually goes through a lighting control system that also ties to the BAS system. And then there's daylighting controls because there is a lot of glass around some of the perimeter. And there's also a couple skylights in there that allow for reduction of, of artificial lighting. I'm going to ask Gretchen to come up and talk a little bit about the uh, mechanical systems.
Can you get this turned on? Everybody hear me? Okay. So uh, I was kind of the person down in the weeds on this project. Um, Bob gave you a great overview of the systems and actually I kind of learned some stuff because I was literally, um, you know, the day-to-day -day doing the functional testing. So um, I'll go over our uh, mechanical systems for you real quickly. We had a basic geothermal heat pump system and um, our well field was out under the athletic fields. Um, we had your basic uh, primary secondary system um, pumping with VFDs and lead lag. The uh, secondary system worked off a low select of three DP sensors um, out in the space. And if you kind of remember what that floor plan looked like, um, you would think the that furthest away um, on the screen, it was the bottom wing of the uh, classrooms when we were on the other end for the um, geothermal system would be the worst one, but actually it wasn't, so who knows. Um, then on the geothermal side, the pumps were um, controlled by uh, the temperature of the secondary system. And they tried to keep that loop between 63 degrees and 77 degrees. And if the, you know, if the loop got below 60, they would turn the pumps on until it got to be 63, or if, they, if it got above 80, turn it on until it got um, below 77. Um, this was part of the um, unoccupied uh, systems as well. Um, whenever the school was, went into unoccupied, this system would go as well. And if a, a zone water source heat pump um, required to come back to occupied for whatever reason, it could be um, temperature, humidity, CO2, then it would give a signal to this system to start first. Um, and actually none of that worked at the start, so it was interesting. Um, the zone water source heat pumps were, um, you know, in place of VAV boxes, so they um, served all the classrooms, um, gymnasium had a couple of them, the kitchen um, had its own, and dining room in specific had its own, and those um, kitchen, dining, and gym were the ones that had um, dedicated outside air ducts um, ducted right into the water source heat pumps. Um, the classroom wings actually had um, the outside air ducted just into the spaces. Most of these came with um, two compressors. They were factory controlled. Um, the interface with the BMS, BMS started, stopped them, and put them into their occupancy modes. Um, you could adjust the set points from the BMS, and then they had a um, high-low temperature alarm. Um, these are Florida heat pump units, and um, that's not what was designed, but they came and they gave um, quite a, a presentation of why the school should go with their um, systems, and said they could do the sequence of operation when in reality they really couldn't do that sequence, so I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, we also had a, a condenser water to water heat pump for the domestic hot water, and this system had a 400 gallon storage tank, and the first system that would supply, um, keep that at temperature at 115 degrees was the water to water heat pump system. And if it couldn't keep um, the system at temperature between 115 and 120, then the, um, the secondary uh, gas-fired uh, water heater would kick in. Now that water heater um, served the kitchen all the time, so it was always available to um, supplement the um, water to water if it couldn't maintain. We didn't really have a whole lot of uh, problems with this system. Um, Kind of before we got to deep functional testing with it, um, our project manager from Hanson, uh, Vince Stewart, um, they were kind of pre-testing stuff and uh, the pumps kept deadheading. They just kept going off and he actually found that the system was piped wrong. So they had to take a couple weeks and repipe things. But once they got that going um, and we had uh, 
um, this was controlled by Siemens, so they did um, control the, the valve and the pumps and temperature control, and they did a, they did a great job with that. Um, as Bob mentioned, we had dedicated outdoor air systems. Um, they had energy recovery wheels, um, again, factory controls. Um, they, the CO2 sensors controlled the um, volume of the ventilation. And this system was actually the first stage of heating and cooling. We had, like Bob mentioned, we had occupancy sensors everywhere. So during the occupied, normal occupied hours, if a, a room wasn't being used, it would, by its occupancy sensor, actually go into un, unoccupied mode. So the DOAS systems kept running because not everything was in um, unoccupied. So they, by de facto, became the uh, first stage of heating and cooling. So I'll go through some common issues that we had with each system, and I'll say overall the um, running issue we had was um, coordination between the different control systems. You know, we had Siemens as the BAS contractor. Um, each of these components had factory controls. Now, the, the geothermal heat pump system was actually um, controlled directly by Siemens. So um, it worked pretty well. We did have some flow issues, and this was because Siemens didn't have control, direct control of all the water source heat pumps, so they couldn't do a global command to open all those for the balancer to, to do his proper balancing. So, you know, he did a proportional balance and then really didn't do the, um, the overall balance. So we found that a lot of our uh, water source heat pumps were going out um, from low flow. But all that got fixed. Um, the groundwater temperature, like I said before, between 63 and 77. And one thing we noticed during um, design review is um, what they're maintaining that loop at is not what they designed the equipment for. So we thought it might be a problem, but actually um, through the last winter, even though it was, you know, it was a pretty severe winter for North Carolina, they don't get the, the type of snow that they did this last year. And we didn't really have many problems. So we're hoping because it doesn't get a lot of use during summer, that that's not going to be a factor. They are using the school a little bit in the summer. The admin area is going to be um, occupied, and then some of the gym areas and stuff like that will have some usage during the summer. And that last one, that outside air temperature, really wasn't a factor on this job, but I had just completed another project very similar to this, and this was a, a huge problem, so I thought I'd throw it out there just for your, um, for your benefit. So this was in Virginia Beach, and, you know, it's right, right on the ocean, and we had, they also had a very severe winter, and they just totally weren't prepared for it. So their loop temperature um, from the ground source was around 40 to 45 degrees, which is too cold to, to use. Um, and they didn't really need it because there was enough um, in and out from the, the primary loop that it kept at a decent temperature. But then they had a freak warm day, like 70 degrees after a, a 32 degree uh, day before. And so because it got so hot, it was actually called for the system to go into cooling. So it, all these valves, you know, changed, the pump started, and then everything went out because the water was just too cold. So high head, head pressure issues. The zone um, heat pumps. Here's where we had um, some miscommunication in the submittal process. Um, everything was approved for BACnet IP, and the water source heat pumps and the, the water to water heat pump um, for the domestic water actually came BACnet MSTP. So it took a little coordination to get um, the units to talk to each other. And that did kind of, you know, it kind of delayed things a little bit because. Um, Siemens couldn't see hardly anything off these systems. So the, the dynamic graphics did end up being a little bit disappointing because um, Siemens just couldn't see everything that we expected to see, um, like the condenser water valve, they couldn't see that. Um, that was actually wired directly to the compressor, so if the compressor came on, we had to assume the valve opened. And we did enough actually 
got some shoe leather in there and, and checked a whole bunch of them and made sure that that um, actually was occurring. And you could tell by temperatures whether it, it did or not as well. Couldn't see the reversing valve. Um, so that was, you know, we, we could tell by discharge air temperature whether things were going okay, but we really had expected to be able to see that valve. Um, the interval controls at one point weren't sourced to the BMS. Um, and this was just, you know, a handful here and there. And we were lucky that they came up in our um, sample and that we found it and they went back and checked every single one of them. But because they weren't sourced to the BAS, um, the units didn't go into unoccupied. But when, um, so it didn't, didn't let the geothermal system go into unoccupied as well. So that thing ran all the time when it, it really wasn't needed. Um, and that did get corrected. Now I told you before that most of those water source heat pumps had two compressors. Um, the heating CFM that was set up by the design team um, was too low um, to run both compressors. And I, I actually took a little bit of figuring out because we would have great discharge air temperature, 100 degrees, and then the second compressor would come on, on and it would drop to 75 degrees. So um, they, e easy fix on that one, they just increased all the heating CFMs. Um, the water source heat pumps I told you that had um, CO2 sensors and outside air sensors ducted or outside air ducted right into the um, unit had their factory CO2 co controls and they didn't go into unoccupied if the sensors were enabled by the BMS. Now there was occupancy or CO2 sensors all over spaces that were controlled by the BMS. These that were associated directly with a water source heat pump were not um, supposed to be enabled by the BMS. And at one point they were, so um, that as well got um, figured out. Um, another thing is the thermostats came with a slider control um, that enabled the user to actually um, control outside the parameters of the energy model. So, um, and that could not be controlled by the BMS. It's just something that had to be um, taken into account because the users were gonna use those sliders. Um, the DOAS systems, um, they originally were just controlling off their own discharge air temperature set point, which is not what design was. They were supposed to be looking at the um, load from the uh, water source heat pumps. So if all the water source heat pumps were in cooling, they were supposed to deliver a 55 degree um, set point. If they were all in heating, a 95 degree set point, and if there was a mix, um, a 70 degree set point. So they were just doing a flat 70, so we, we got that fixed. Um, similarly, the, um, we had some flow issues because the, the DOAS was not set up properly by the TAB contractor because he couldn't open everything to do a final balance. But he did get that performed. Um, the DOAS um, had its own control system. Siemens was limited by what they could see. We couldn't see the hot gas reheat, the wheel bypassed um, dampers. Um, the DOAS and water source heat pumps weren't giving the BMS a start signal from the unoccupied mode. So that night set back, CO2, that sort of thing. So they were starting, but the geothermal system didn't start. So as soon as they started and didn't have flow, they crashed. Um, so a couple of lessons learned. Um, on this project, we actually did conduct the um, conductivity well and loop testing, which turned out good for us because it came in um, looking like it was gonna be adequate. Um, what we didn't do well on this project was the controls integration. Um, we should have had a meeting right up front. Um, we didn't get the equipment that was specified, so um, I'm not sure we really understood the extent of the problems we were gonna have because of the controls integration, but as soon as we knew we were getting all ki kinds of equipment that wasn't um, from design, we probably should have had an, an upfront controls integration meeting. Um, which we didn't, so uh, we wrote the 
test procedures on the approved control submittal, which for the water source heat pumps, he just said C manufacturer. So that was a real challenge to get those um, test procedures written. And we had two or three iterations because we would write it according to design and then they would say, um, we don't do that. So, and I'm like, well, what do you do? Well, you know, we do this, this, and this. I'm like, well, okay, you have all these options. Tell me which ones you're gonna do for this project because this is how we wanted to control. So that took um, a lot of back and forth um, with the various vendors. Um, the lighting controls and CO2 sensors um, need, needed to be coordinated with the control submittal. Um, like Bob said, the um, lighting controls would put the units into unoccupied. So um, there was some coordination that needed to happen there. Um, what was not in the BAS specs is that we wanted continuous monitoring of the BAS system after the, the project was finished. So um, that was a little bit added cost um, to get that in there. And then the, um, the owner and the engineer didn't quite have their schedules worked out prior. Um, but we, we got that worked out pretty early and they had to um, kind of relook at their energy model to make sure that it, um, they took into account the new schedules. And I think Bob's gonna. Okay, thank you, Gretchen. So as, as Gretchen was talking about, uh, clearly the biggest challenge on this project was controls integration. And I can tell you from a number of other projects that, we're, that we have commissioned and that we're currently commissioning, that is our biggest challenge at this point. Because there is so much equipment being shipped with package controls. And you know, her comment, you know, we will have a meeting during design to talk about controls integration. We typically have a meeting prior to construction to talk about controls integration. And now what she said in lessons learned, we're feeling we have to have a meeting at the start of submittals before they come in to have another meeting on controls integration because it, that you just cannot meet enough to get this stuff worked out. There's so many different communication protocols. Uh, if they start substituting equipment, and even as she noted, we, the, the submittals came in and we were supposed to get uh, the BACnet IP for the water source heat pumps and the water to water heat pumps, yet it shipped wrong you know, with MSTP. So you just can't do enough. But to talk a little bit again about the project, Siemens had the front end. It was a Siemens Apogee system. And as Gretchen mentioned, they had direct control of the pumps on the geothermal system. But all the other things that they had to interface with, which was the water source heat pump, the water to water heat pump, the DOAS units, which were by Aon and had their own package controls, the solar PV panels, which basically had a um, data acquisition system, which oversaw those. The resource monitoring system, and if you jump down, you see Affinity Automation, okay? That was a system that, it's actually a company out of Charlotte, uh, to measure and verify utilities. It tied into the metering system. They have their own proprietary Utilitrend cloud-based energy tracking system which they claimed initially was compatible, it could communicate by Modbus, it could communicate by Lawn Work, BACnet, whatever. That didn't really prove to be true. We had to go through several iterations to get that correct. That data ended up having to get pushed through the Siemens system and then out to the Lucid dashboard. And there was a lot of information being lost in translation there. And then the Lucid dashboard, which was a web-based dashboard that there's actually a monitor within the lobby of the school, you know, and it's, it's, inter, uh, it's got a user interface, uh, but it's also web-based. And so it not only is available there, they push it out to the um, smart boards in all the classrooms. They really use this school and the data from this school to help teach the students. And they've really got engaged students. Um, what we've heard is that these students are going home, they're talking to their parents, they're talking about energy conservation, and they're trying to get their, their parents engaged in it. So it really has worked out well. So the Lucid dashboard is a system that if you work with it or not, it, 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 it can be customized. 
It has been customized on this particular project. Uh, it tracks building systems, sub-metering. There's a number of things that you can develop with it. It will also display weather information. It can be updated as, as frequently as once a minute. It also holds and, and can display historic information. It can enable what they call energy and water competitions. Now, it's not doing that right now for this school, but the way that the school is metered with the three different classroom wings, they can do that. You could do it in a large office building if you're trying to do competitions between different floors on trying to reduce their energy consumption. It can be done in a campus setting. If you've got, for example, multiple buildings, multiple residence halls, and you're trying to do competition between the residence halls to try to reduce energy consumption. Again, it shows real time. It also talks about some of the green features. And as I said, not only can be through panels in the school or to the smart boards, you can also access it through the web. And that's exactly what we're going to do today. We're going to go out there and take a look at it. And I can show you some of the features of it. Um, bring it up here. This is really, what you're seeing here is the, uh, okay, how come this didn't come up? If I, once I escape this, I want to go back to the presentation. Will it go back? We'll, we'll get you back to the okay. presentation. Okay. Just go, okay. Good. So, okay, this is the introduction screen that you see when you come up. So we're going to go through. I'm going to go through several of the uh, options here, and we'll talk about electricity first. So, this is actually today. So this is the the number of kilowatt hours um, that have been consumed today. Um, a couple of things that you'll see here, performance now, and it says 52% below comparable times of recent weeks. One of the reasons for that is um, it, we are actually having some pretty mild weather this week in North Carolina, and we've had pretty cold weather the last few weeks. So it's very dependent upon what's happened with respect to the weather right now. One of the things I mentioned earlier, and I want to bring this up again, is I talked about the fact that the meters split and the 504 kW, you know, is a sell-all to the utility, but the other 85 kW goes into the, the school. And it depends upon what the demand is. And you can kind of see right here, there's 80. It's only really been above that today. So they've not been buying much power today, okay? Um, at least in the time that the photovoltaic is on. Now, again, the photovoltaic is only obviously during the day. Uh, but we can go back. You can, you can select a time scale. You can take a look at previous days. You can take a look at previous weeks. I'll take a look at last week, for example. Kilowatt hours last week. You can kind of see the, the different days. You see it tails off Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Last week happened to be a holiday weekend with Easter. So you can kind of see that a good Friday it went down. Uh, something else that's interesting is you can select the unit equivalent. Now this is what's interesting. Everything is in kilowatt hours, so we'll talk about dollars for a second. There's the equivalent of dollars for last week. We'll take another equivalent. We'll talk about carbon emissions. So we'll take a look and we'll see what the carbon emissions in pounds of CO2 for last week. 12,869. And then, again, because it's been set up for a school and people like to look at different options, we'll take a look at laptop hours. So if you take a look at equivalent hours of 35-watt laptop use la uh, last week, it was 301,000 laptop hours of use. Okay, So it's things like that, that that you have the capability. As I mentioned, the wings are metered separately, so we can take a look at the three different wings and how much power is being used. We can take a look at the solar side. And obviously, you kind of see here, now this is, this is again today, OK? So if you take a look, take a look at total production, kilowatt hours, 2107, total use, 757. So it's producing a lot more power today that's being consumed, okay? Uh, obviously, 
it's being fed back into the grid, okay? But let's just take a look, and I happen to have looked at this earlier, so I, I, I did the math on it. We'll take a time scale. We'll take a look at last week. So if I look at last week for a second, and this is photovoltaic production versus uh, total use. So if you take a look last week at the uh, total production, 14,530 kilowatt hours. At the total use, 10,566, okay? If you take that difference and you look at it, it's right around 37.5%. So last week, the production was about 37.5% greater than the consumption in terms of that school. Uh, we've got other things like geothermal. The geothermal takes a look and says, okay, how much energy has been saved by the loops today? And again, it's a very mild day, okay? So it's, it's taking a look. Now, we've got an anomaly there, and I'm not sure what happened at 10 o'clock. We'll have to take a look at that. But it's taking a look at heating and cooling. You've got comparison. They do break out the lighting, the plug loads, and the HVAC. Uh, it does talk about green features. They can use this as a tool to talk about, you know, some of the features of the school. You know, they can go around that. Uh, it does have the capability, as I said, about competition. There are no competitions now, but if you did have competitions and you were feeding meter data in from different buildings or floors or wings or whatever, you could do that. And then the last thing is the, uh, the weather data. So th th this particular, I don't, I don't think I ever said where this school was located. It's in Lumber Bridge, North Carolina, which again is in Hoke County, H-O-K-E. It's, it's a very rural area. Um, again, it's very low income area. But right now, there's, there's the data. It's 68 degrees Fahrenheit, so it's a very mild day. Uh, wind speed, wind direction, uh, relative humidity. So all that data is available. So, the data is available out there. It's, it's, you can actually go out to the website. It's available to the public. Um, uh, talking a little bit, I'll just jump out here for a second here. Um, let's see if I can get it. Uh, as far as this school goes, I made the comment about, uh, let's go forward. Where do you got to go to slide? Right there? Yeah, it's just in minutes. It's like the blue. Not the red. I'll just go. Okay. Just curious. Okay, so as far as the school goes, the school was awarded from Engineering News Record, ENR. It was a project of the year in 2013 in the category of K through 12 educational project, okay? Engineering News Record breaks up the country into different regions and awards in different categories, university, so on and so forth. So this one, Southeast, Project of the Year for Engineering News Record, K through 12 category. Then what they do is they roll all the winners from the various regions together and they award what they call the best of the best project. And this school won the best of the best for ENR for 2013 for K through 12. Um, as far as interest, the uh, first floor people have been um, aggressive and out there. They've talked to many other counties, many other school systems. There's a lot of school systems that are very interested in it, and they're starting to sign up. Uh, they just completed design on two more middle schools for a totally separate county. These schools are slightly larger. They're about 94,000 square feet because they include auditoriums, some additional spaces that this school did not have. Uh, same arrangement. There'll be P3 delivery. They'll be net positive, okay? Uh, but what's interesting is not only are they being approached on school systems because they've got other counties that are talking to them about high school, so on and so forth. They've got other people coming to them now talking about other projects. There's a county that's come to them talking about doing some sort of a, a baseball stadium. There's a county that came to them talking to them about doing a, kind of a convention center, a small convention center. Same concept.
they want to do P3, they want to be able to lease the, the project back over time. So there's a lot of interest in that. Okay. Well, these are other pictures that we have. Okay. I'm going to go back up. All right. Went the wrong way. Okay. There. All right. So there's the. You got that slide? There. Okay, so there, so then again, there's a there's a picture of the school. Like I said, it was awarded ENR Best Project for 2013, and that basically concludes our presentation today. We're available for any questions you might have, talking about uh, anything on the project. So any questions you might have, feel free to ask. Go ahead. I have two questions. Sure. Um, Okay, the first question was, to my knowledge, I don't know any other entities that are uh, pursuing P3 projects now in North Carolina. Uh, this first floor, K through 12 solutions, is sort of a unique animal. Um, if you knew the gentleman that runs this, and he runs SFLA, he's kind of a visionary, and he, he, he just comes up with these ideas, and he looks at his staff, both the development side and on the architectural side, and says, okay, how do we do this? How do we do this? Um, how they were selected, they made the pitch. They basically saw this opportunity. This legislation came about about two years ago, um, and they saw this as an opportunity, and, and they really do believe that this is part of the wave of the future. And you are seeing, I mean, we know Florida just passed this legislation about a year ago. So these opportunities are out there. So it wasn't a competitive selection. They went into the county, sat down with the school district, sat down with the county commissioners. Uh, I, I actually have a presentation, it's proprietary, but they have a huge presentation that's all financial where they go through the, the whole concept and they compare everything. It, it was done by a, a big investment firm. And that, that's how they pitch it. They, they say, here's, here's why this makes sense. And then it goes from there, okay? Now, your second question about maintenance and operations. <sighs> okay, a couple of things. Right now, as I mentioned to you, they, first floor, are responsible for the maintenance of the systems, you know, because they're the owner. So uh, what they're doing, it, they have people, but for the most part, they entered into long-term maintenance and operation agreements with some of the contractors. For example, the Power Secure's got all the maintenance on the PV system, okay? Now, they have trained, okay, some of the Hope County representatives, but right now, it's, they're not really picking up the maintenance, but they have done some training in that regard. What's sort of unique right now is that the checks that they're receiving from the utility company are how they, because it, it is net positive, are what's funding their maintenance. They basically are taking the money that they're getting from the utility company, you know, for the power that they're selling, and they're using that to help maintain the schools, okay? Does that answer your question? Okay. And yeah, yes? I've got a couple of questions, one financial, one technical. Uh, on the financial side, you said about uh, cash flow analysis that was done to show that's uh, net positive cash flow. Yes. Uh, you, was there the operational uh, and maintenance costs considered for uh, certain uh, parts of the system on this 40-year cash flow for uh, PV, for example, for the, uh, for the, uh, you know, the inverter, typically the lives are about 10 to 12 years probably. Yeah, I, I've had that, again, we're the commissioning people, and so I, I'm not privy to all that information. I do know the questions have been asked, you know, what's the expected life of all these panels? And these panels really haven't been out there long enough to really have an anticipated life. They, they've talked to the company. I think these panels are like 30 or 35 years, they believe that they'll have a life. The inverters, I don't know. These are big industrial inverters. Uh, 
you telling me 10 to 12, I don't know what, what the life of these are. Okay. I, you know, I don't, like I said, they're financing maintenance right now with the revenue stream they've got coming in from the utility company. I, I don't know how much O&M was factored into their business model. See, I don't, I'm not privy to all their business model, uh, see, so that, I'm sorry, I can't maybe totally answer that question. What was your other question? You had a tech. Well, on that, uh, I've got another one. Do you know what the break even was then? Um, just 40 years of that net cash flow. Uh, <coughs> when was it expected to be break? break the well, th all these lease arrangements are done in, in a different way. Um, actually, on this one, it's... On this one, the way the lease is set up is as follows, okay? It's really a five-year lease, okay? It, you burn through, it's set up, the ownership en entity is set up for a five-year period. It burns through the new market um, credits, okay, or tax credits, new market tax credits. At the end of the five years, it's gonna, the ownership's gonna revert back to the school system. However, the way it's been set up financially, okay, is they're gonna pay the same amount of money as they assume, the, so to speak, the mortgage or the payments as they're paying for the lease. So it's not gonna be any different to them, okay? So, and they will also get ownership of the utility rebates, or the, 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 uh, the money being paid from the utility company. They will take ownership of that money, and it's envisioned that they'll use that money then to maintain the, the school, so. Okay, on the technical side, um, I think uh, I heard, uh, we're talking about uh, not being able to maintain the loop temperature on both sides, uh, the low and the high end. Uh, was there originally any kind of plan uh, that might have been bad engineer or something for a uh, hybrid type of uh, uh, ground source system where you have additional uh, heat rejection and heat sources uh, designed into the uh, system uh, in addition to uh, your uh, uh, ground source uh, heat source system? I don't think so because in North Carolina, I don't think they did the extremes that they certainly got this year. So, because I, I kind of asked the same question, I'm like, do you not want a boiler system to mm -hmm. boost that temperature if you need it? And no, I don't think it was. I mean, they might have considered it early on, um, you know, in systematics or something, but um, no, it, it never showed up. Yeah, I mean, that would be a. I, it's, it's a valid question, but I think that would have to go back to Optum Engineering, the MEP engineers, the, but it was not provided by. It's, it's typically not. I mean, we, I've seen several schools, military facilities in North Carolina, and rarely do they have any kind of um, temporary discrimination. You're going to be able to cover the range of operations. Yeah, if you can finish on uh, close enough with the conductivity and modeling. Okay, um, I've been told we're out of time. So I do appreciate everybody. I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much for coming today. And